<laughs> but I have a special treat for you this morning. I, most of you know Pastor Kevin. He's uh, on the board of directors here. He actually dedicated this church two years ago. Actually, two years in what? February, March, April, May, June. Wow, well, we're almost two and a half years old. We need to have another celebration, don't we? We just need to have reasons to party. So two and a half years, we'll just throw a big shindig, cook a whole hog, come on somebody, bring all the fixings and... Just well, six more months, you know. Yeah, I've talked to a teenager. They say, how old are you? I'm 13 and a half. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm like, 13 and a half, really? Okay. All right. You know, they got to give you that six months. Hey, I'm almost, I'm halfway 14, but but we're going to be two and a half years real soon and and uh, just excited about what God's doing. Excited about you. Excited about you being here. But I want to just give a small introduction. I don't want to take up any more time because I believe uh, the man of God has a, a word in season. It's a timely word for us. But uh, Pastor Kevin and I go way back, um, all the way to middle school. <laughs> and uh, no, we weren't serving God. And uh, we've, uh, we've had a long history together. And um, I went one way in the worst possible way you could go and he went to the ministry come on somebody at 19 20 was ordained went to uh, school at jerry savelle's out at faith heritage and uh, him and his wife terry uh spent two years out there and has been under brother copeland and many others and um it's so exciting to have him here today because um you know this is a man that has been with me from the beginning and um, god brought us back together and he is in his 20th year of ministry. Faith City is our sister church. Uh, they're five years old. Come on, somebody. And they have already outlasted all the statistics that say five years, usually a church plant will fail. So the devil is a lie. Uh, they are working on their sixth year. It's exploding down there. God's doing so many things. And um, I want you just to stand up and give a warm welcome to the man of God and my pastor, Pastor Kevin Wright. Thank you. Love you. Well, thank you. God bless you this morning. Thanks for calling me out there, Pastor. And summertime is a crowded time. How about that? All right. And uh, people come to church in the summer, right? And uh, I'm excited to be here. I, I I just enjoy being here every time I'm here. I love what every time I come, it seems like this church is like new paint on the wall and something's built and. You guys really have prospered in two years. When I first started at Faith City, I remember um, we had different color chairs. I mean, one was purple, one was green. I mean, you came to our church. We just had, and it was almost like everybody brought a chair from home, you know what I mean? And it just, you do what you got to do, you know, when we first got started. Our church in five years had seven relocations. Seven relocations. Everybody say Seven. We changed so much that you had to pray in the Spirit to find out where we were going to be next. As I mean, that's how fast. I remember one week, a door closed, and the next week we were somewhere else, and we called, our church was so small, we called everybody up and said, we ain't meeting there no more. We're meeting over here. And then everybody else, if, if you came, <laughs> just, oh, they're not here anymore. You, you know, you, that's why you should come to church, because if your church is somewhere else next week, you need to know where it's going to be, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we just changed all the time, and I've had the privilege of being in the ministry since I was 19. I'll be 40 this year, and uh, whew, 40, big four. Oh, come on, come on. Um, I enjoy life. I enjoy uh, 15 years of marriage, and just I'm married to my wife Terry, of course, and she's preaching back home in Titusville. Her series is called The Living Dead. Come on. Come on. I know y'all been watching Walking Dead. I don't, but some of y'all be watching that. See, I saw some hands, y'all. You, you ain't even ashamed up in church. <laughs> and we've been t she's talking about the living dead, about people living life but not truly living life. And there is no living life without Jesus. Amen. She's back home preaching. We believe that women ought to be able to share the gospel too. Amen. And uh, the, the women can do it just as good as the man. Some of y'all men, y'all just got mad at that statement. But I believe that women can do it just as good as a man. They're anointed just as much as I'm anointed. Amen. And they, they have their place in church. And my wife, and she's a teacher. And she's home teaching. And uh, I come back, they say, we don't, we'd rather have Terry teaching. <laughs> Honest, it's the truth. She, she went to Bible school with me and... Um, 
I would cheat off her. She'd be sitting next to me and be like, Thank you. and then I'd get all convicted, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, cheating in Bible school just don't go good, does it? And I was in, I remember growing up and, you know, me and Sean, Pastor Sean went to middle school together. And I'm not going to tell you about his B.C. before Christ. You would probably already know, but he was a wild one. That's all I'm going to say. And I was a wild one. My nickname was K-Wild. That was my nickname in high school. I was wild. And then um, my dad got in a bad car accident um, around 19, I think it was 1992. My dad was in a horrible car accident, dead on arrival, had a brain injury. And my dad used to make me watch Kenneth Copeland all the time. And uh, I hated watching Kenneth Copeland. I mean, he'd turn him on, and that was our church. I was like, God, you know, you know, teenagers back then, you're like, ah. You know, falling asleep, acting like you're sleeping. But when crisis came, all of a sudden you wanted everything that man was preaching to come to pass for you. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And I was that kid. My dad would say, look me in the eyes when I talk to you. And I would not look him in the eyes. I was rebellious as rebellious can be. I probably had more beatings in this church than all of you put together. I've been beat because I was so rebellious. Um, But my dad, Curtis, he was my third dad. But he's the only one that ever earned the title, Dad. Anybody know what I'm talking about? My real dad didn't earn the title, but my dad, Curtis, earned it. And he brought Jesus into my life. And so I started um, going back to those Brother Copeland tapes. Back then we had tapes. You know, anybody remember tapes? Um, so we went back to those tapes. I, I have a 1997 Lincoln parked in this and it, in this church parking lot, and it still has tapes, and I have Jerry Savelle tapes. Come on, come on. So <laughs> you think you think I've uh, went on to CDs? I I, I don't. I my, I have to have tapes that match my car. You give me a car with a CD player, I'll graduate. All right, but until then, I got that 1997 Lincoln. And I've been to Alabama, Texas, Georgia, can't tell you how many times. Never broke down one time. That old car is getting me around the United States, man. And um, I speak good things about that car. And it's been a really good car to me. And I started listening to those Kenneth Copeland tapes. And, and, and Brother Copeland impacted my life in such a way that I started be changing my life. I started uh, getting in the Word of God. Ended up going to Jerry Savelle's school for two years, leaving the beach. The hardest thing I've ever done in my life is leave that beach to Fort Worth, Texas, Crowley, Texas, Cowtown. Anybody heard of Crowley? Crowley, Texas, outside of Fort Worth. And uh, what my wife and I did for fun, we went to the stockyard shows and looked at the cows and <laughs> I'm serious and watched the bull rides. Anybody like bull riding in here? Watch. You know, uh, the bull riding shows, that was me. That's what we did, and that's the closest I can get to deer hunting, and, and, and that's all I did. I just went out and did that, okay? And then um, during the summers, came back home to tie But That's a little bit about my life, and I'm honored to be with you. Pastor Sean, you are a man of God, my best friend, and I believe in you. I believe in this ministry, and I, I believe you have an a awesome pastor A pastor that cares for you. I talk to him just about every day. And he always talks about you. You're his favorite subject. You really are. And so we spend time praying about you. Praying about this church. And just praying that God does something with Grace City. That you guys grow and prosper. God didn't put you here to die. He put you here to flourish. And uh, in two years, you definitely are further along than Faith City. I remember when we got to Titusville. It was our... So we were two, two and a half years. Our average crowd for those first four months there, we had went from 100 and something people down to 40. Because we moved from 30 minutes over and everybody's like, he didn't hear God. Well, now our average crowd's close to 170. And you know, we've had some growth. And I'm believing, or, I mean, you guys are so much further along than I was. And so let's give your pastor a big hand. I mean, what a blessing. <laughs> Amen. Um, If you got your Bibles, go ahead to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to get in the Word. Anybody hungry for the Word? Is this a Word church? Y'all talk about the Word here? All right. Pastor Sean said I got about two hours. I'm going to take every bit of it. Ain't nobody... 
you know, y'all just lost somebody right then. They're like, dear God, I, I got fried chicken ready for me at home. I'm going to get on that chicken. Um, and yeah, Pastor Sean, he's updated to a CD player and an iPad. I still got notes. I'm still writing. Yeah, you know, you know, he, he's, he's all new school. I'm sticking with some old school, all right? And he's got his Bible there on his iPhone. Um, I got leather back, baby. Come on. Any leather back in here? Still leather back? Boy, I, I'm gaining some crowd here today, boy. I'm gain, how many tape players still we got here? Tape players? I love you guys. I really do. I love you. I want to talk to you. It's one of those titles. I really don't even have a title, but I'm going to give it one. Because it, it's something I just want to share. I want to talk to you about the God of the Breakthrough. It, the God of the breakthrough. Have you ever awakened in the morning with a smile on your face, feeling great, looking forward to the day ahead, and suddenly all of hell's power breaks loose? You're driving down the freeway. Your car seems to be running great, and suddenly everything falls apart. Anybody ever had that happen to you? Have you ever been in a situation like where a storm rises out of nowhere? Your child's tuition increases. Your electric bill went up. Come on, summertime. Your spouse suddenly decides they are no longer happy in the marriage. You go to the doctor for a routine checkup and discover you, you got a disease. And that's the way the devil operates. He loves to catch us off guard. Life storms. He's hoping that the unexpected attack will cause you to panic and you'll be unprepared to deal with it and quit and blame God. And that is what has happened over these years. I've realized that some attacks are like overnight and some attacks are series. Anybody ever been in a series? One chapter after the other. It seemed like, man, you, and you've even let it come out your mouth. When it rains, it pours. Anybody ever said it? One attack after the other. You realize, my goodness. I mean, this seems like, you know, one chapter after the other. When are things ever going to change? When are we going to see a breakthrough? When are we, when are we going to see God do what He promised? When are we going to see increase in our finances? When are we going to get the promotion? When am I going to be totally healed of this? When is the manifestation going to get here? Anybody been there? I mean, anybody ever questioned, God, where are you? I'm out here in my faith. I'm out here believing God. I'm out here quoting scripture. Boy, I'm getting excited already. I hadn't even started. This is the introduction. Anybody ever been there? I mean, we're talking about real life. I mean, you're looking for the happy world, you know, where everything is smooth. God, you know, you, you get 16, you got the 2013 car keys. That ain't the way it happened in my life. My dad, you know, that I have now, I turned 16. He handed me over a 1977 Thunderbird. 351 Cleveland in that joker. And, I, you know, and I'm like, I was ashamed at 16 to drive that big old car. I can't get delivered from big cars. I still drive. I like big cars, and I cannot lie. Come on. I like big cars, man. If you press the gas and then the brake, you got automatic hydraulics. Come on. So I'd hit that gas. I mean, that 77 Thunderbird, I mean, it literally, it went through hell. It really did. I mean, I took that car. I remember going out to play Linda Beach, and I had the big barrels on the side of the road. Me and my friends would hit those barrels and see how far we could launch them. I mean, I'm hitting them. Sandbags going everywhere. Didn't dent that 77 Thunderbird one bit. When I asked my friends to, you know, to go out with me, I could fit all of them in the car. Come on. I mean, I can fit 10 bodies in my Lincoln. Don't ask me how I know how. I'm just playing. It's a joke. I mean, li literally, my Lincoln, we all went out the other night, had seven people in it. No air. I got the air fixed all right. Pastor Sean came up and fixed my air. I mean, you just kind of just do what you got to do. If that's what you have, you make the best of it, and you believe God. You know, you, no, no reason to complain about life. Just, hey, there's a series of events that takes place. 
And I got to thinking about your church, Pastor, and about this place and about your life and praying. Pastor Sean said, what are you going to preach? I said, I don't know. Maybe God will use me as a prophet. Maybe I'll just speak something that I feel that's a word in season for your ministry. I don't know if you're there today. I don't know if you're under attack. But I do know the very first thing is don't panic. Are you there in Mark chapter 4? Let's go with verse 13. You've heard this probably from Pastor Sean. And I call him Theo. That's his nickname. Theo. Short for theologian. Because me, I'll dumb it up for you. Right? I'll, I'll chop this thing up. Theo right here. Let's see, he's going to talk about Mark chapter 4. And then he's going to go to you know, Luke. And then he's going to get, he'll do 10 scriptures on one. I'm just going to dumb it up for you. I'm going to tell you one scripture only. All right? <laughs> but Theo will tell you all kinds. Aren't you glad you got Theo here today? Pastor Theo <laughs> gets to teach at Andrew Womack. I never got asked to teach at a Bible school. I wasn't smart enough. I don't know what it is. They, they, ta uh, they take you and ask you to preach at Andrew Womack school. Nobody even knows who I am. Uh, all right. Mark chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Know ye not this parable. How then will you know all parables? Would you say this parable is important? Come on. Would you say this parable is important? If you don't know this parable, how then will you know all parables? The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but... You see, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard it, what does it say? Y'all got your Bibles? What does it say? When people hear the word, what happens? Satan comes when? What's he after? What's he after? The word, the seed. So when the word is sown, who comes to get the seed? Satan is after what? He's after the word. Who said that? Did Pastor Kevin say that? Who said that? And Jesus said, if you don't know this parable, how will you know all parables? Satan is after the word. And as soon as the word is sown, Satan comes when? Immediately to steal the seed that was sown. Would you say the word of God is important? Would you say the Word of God is the only thing that truly has a life-transforming uh, change agent in it? Amen. Hello, Miss Tara. How are you this morning? So, would you say the Word of God is the only thing that has the life-changing agent in it? Amen? Would you say the Word changes people? How many people has been changed by the Word? I'm telling you, man can do certain things. But there are certain things that only the Word of God can do for mankind. You can, you can go, I, I don't know about y'all, man. You know that old song that earthly things have left me dry, only Jesus can satisfy? That's been me too many times. I've tried to change myself, and I found out only one thing that can change Kevin Wright is the Word of God. Amen. Now, once the word is sown, Satan will come in immediately to take away the word. Therefore, we must guard the word and we must resist anything that comes after the word. Amen. That means when Satan comes to steal the word, we are to resist him. That we are to guard what God does in our lives. Because if Satan is after the word, would you say that means that Satan could steal a revelation from you? All of a sudden you find out that it's God's will for you to be healed and you know it's His will, Satan comes after that revelation. The Bible says that people perish because of lack of what? So when the Word is sown, Satan comes immediately to steal the Word that was sown. So are we to guard the Word? Guard the revelation? Guard what God is doing? Guard what, what God is sowing in our lives? Are we to protect that? Amen? And we're going to talk about it. Now go to verse 35. Now, uh, a messy Bible usually means a not-so-messed-up life. So I want you to underline this next statement. We still got sound up here? All right, good. 
What's the very first word in your Bible? In the same day. I got the scripture up here for you. In the same day. Everybody say in the same day. In what same day? In the same day that Jesus said that the, the sower soweth the word and Satan comes immediately to steal the word that was sown. In that same day that Jesus says, the sower soweth the word, I'm the sower, I soweth the word, and Satan comes that in that same day when evening was come, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they have sent away the multitude, they took him just as he was in the ship. Now, you, you know, another translation said that the crowd was so packed up on Jesus, he had to preach in the boat. He had spent hours of preaching, hours of sharing the word, hours of ministry. And now, after all day of doing that, he says, let us go to the other side. Now, I'm telling you right now, if you will guard Right now, what's going on in this room, you won't sleep on me. You'll get a revelation and your life's going to change. Now, if God was going to give you something good, would you take it? Yes. You know, at my church, I see people fall asleep. I make, them, I make the whole church stand up. I'm serious. I make them all. Everybody stand up and they're looking around. Who slept? I tell them, you know, in the book of Acts, you know, that guy fell, out of, fell, fell asleep and fell out of the window. Y'all remember that? I raised people up. I used to take a tennis ball. I said, I'll resurrect you right now. <laughs> I had this one dude, Brian Kwasik, at my church. He always falls asleep. I take the tennis ball, throw it right at his head. True story. True story. I ain't joking. We throw tennis balls at my church. Um, I've fallen asleep. Brother Copeland at Jerry Savelle School, he would come preach four hours straight, no break. This dude next to me, he was drooling. <laughs> I am not joking. We were laughing. And then <laughs> and we would, uh, there, <laughs> there is these girl, these ladies, they would always go, you know, ladies sometimes don't say amen. They'll go, mmm. <laughs> you ever notice that about women? They don't go, sometimes they won't say amen. They go, hmm. Mm. And so me and my buddy Devon, we started going, mm, mm, and the whole row started going, mm. we had a whole class, instead of saying amen, we go, mm. <laughs> and the instructor, you know, our dean got mad at us, he's on my board of directors now, and he, and uh, we messed around so much, we got in trouble, we got the whole class in trouble, they be, we had a sign up, and I put beside We'd put beside certain people's names, prophet or bishop, like, and he put beside me, Bishop Kevin, and I put beside him, Demon Devon. <laughs> and the dean of my school got the sign-up list, corrected the whole school and the whole class like this, and I'm like, oh my God, please, please, Devon, don't stand up and confess your sin. And Devon says, Brother Todd, it was me. And I'm like, ah! And I said, Brother Todd, I wrote Demon besides Devon's name. <laughs> they were just a ministry of excellence, and I just wasn't excellent. <laughs> I still struggle with that. Everybody saying the same day. Now, here's the seed. Now, get this. This is my revelation that what God showed me. He said, let us pass. Who's saying this? Now, the word is what? Seed. And he says, soon as the word is sown, Satan cometh immediately to steal the word. Now here is a, th there's no threat of storm. They didn't say, and it was stormy weather. And Jesus said, let's go to the other side. He said, let us go to the other side. Would you say, that's Jesus sowing the word? And he goes on to say, and when they sent away the multitude, they took him just as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm everybody say great that word great in the greek means mega everybody say mega a mega storm everybody say mega now that word mega literally means enormous huge overwhelming has anybody ever in here encountered a mega storm the word arose in the Greek. Come on, I'm talking Greek now, Theo. Greek 
means, in the, the word arose means unexpected. An unexpected, mega, huge, overwhelming storm. Anybody ever been there? So big, unexpected, there's no way. How can this happen? How could this report be taking place? I mean, I have been there. Just because you are a faith person and just because you are a Christian does not mean you are exempt from storms in your life. The Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into different kinds of trials and tribulations. I've been doing, I just got done with a series at Faith City called Laugh Out Loud. And, and I was teaching our church how to keep their joy in hard times. Boy, joy is not based on your circumstance. Happiness is, but joy is not. The joy of the Lord is based on the Word of God. Come on, that's a free one. Now, you may be facing an unexpected mega storm in your life. So where and why did the storm come? Number one, in other words, this storm was designed by the forces of hell to destroy them. This wasn't God. God how can Bezebub cast out Bezebub? How can a kingdom divided against itself will fall? It wasn't Jesus creating a storm to kill his disciples. Now that's a revelation for some people. You need to know if, if you know, I got, you know, every once in a while I run across sicknesses from God. God's trying to use sickness to teach you something. Listen, if sickness was from God, then don't, don't go to the doctor. As a matter of fact, just stay sick. You need to be as sick as possible. If, if it's from God, you don't need to take aspirin. When you get a headache, you don't need to go to the emergency room. Bless God, if you got a fever of 102, you, you need to get on up to 105. If sickness is from God, then you don't need to resist it. All right, it's quiet up in here, man. I mean, have you went over this with them before? Okay, okay, I'm just making sure. So <laughs> storms are designed by the forces of hell to destroy them. It's a mega storm. The Amplified Bible says a furious storm of wind. Everybody say furious. You ever felt like that the enemy is furious against you? Two, this was not just a little wind blowing. It was a great and severe, so great and severe that it was beating against the ship. Water was in the boat, and those men were frightened. That's a big, big storm. Everybody say huge. Me mega. Peter, James, and John were fishermen. They'd been on boats their whole lives. This storm was so bad that it caused fears to, fear to rise up in them. So when fear arose, they forgot everything they had just been taught that day. That's what I want to bring to you. I'm teaching you. Look, when fear arose, they forgot everything about Jesus. says, hey, the sower went out to sow, and Satan came immediately to steal the word that was sown. Jesus sowed something in them saying, we're going to the other side. That was his promise. This was the Son of God saying, we're going to the other side. And that should have been what they latched their faith on. But instead, they started looking at the storm. And when they looked at the storm, they, they actually thought, there's no way we're going to make it to the other side. They feared for their life. Even though the Son of God said, we're going to the other side. Even though that was His promise. Even though that's what He said was going to happen. They had fear. They did not believe. There, there, was some, there, there was something that the devil was trying to do to steal the word. And he used fear to steal it. He used fear to steal it. He'll always use fear to steal it. Are y'all listening? And that's exactly what Satan was hoping for. Now, that's a destination. God has promised us in His Scripture, in the Word of God, certain things... And right now, in the midst of my life, you may not know me personally, but there are things in my life where I'm depending every bit of my faith for what I'm standing on to happen. But in the natural, I see storm. In the natural, I see things stirring. In the natural, I see mega. In the natural, I see, I see things so much differently. But I don't look at things through these eyes. I look at my eye of faith. Amen. That's my third eye, praise God. Now, let's find out what Jesus is doing. Verse 38. Now, notice that 
Jesus fully intended for these men to get to the other side. It didn't matter the weather was clear or stormy. He intended them to get to the other side. He intends for you to get to the other side of your problem. He, gets, he expects you to come out of your storm. Amen. The only way they were going to make it to their destination was by using God's word, and they didn't. They should have said to the storm, Jesus said we're going to the other side, but they didn't. They feared. Now let's look at, at the verse 38. I think I'm, I don't know if it's up there. Yeah. And Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship. What was he doing? Man, have you ever felt like God was sleeping on your boat in your storm? Come on, seriously. I mean, let's get real right now. You felt like God. I mean, I mean, oh, I heard that God meets all my needs, and all of a sudden, you, you keep decreasing. Anybody ever been there? Pastor Sean talks about tithing. You start tithing, you, and you start tithing, you lose your job. <laughs> seriously, he starts talking about healing, and you go home, and, and you, can't, you can't even use your faith to get your headache off of you. You're like, how can I use my faith for anything else? You mean, I mean real life. That's real life stuff right there, isn't it? And here's, here's what the disciples said. Master, carest not that we perish. They, you know what they said? Don't you care about us? We're in the middle of a storm. Don't you care? And this is what God told me, Pastor, on the way here. They, care, they actually... Care, they actually thought they cared more about them dying than Jesus did. That's what they thought. They, that we care more about you. Look at you. You're asleep. Don't you care about us? They actually thought that, hey, man, we care more about our lives where we perish more than the, the creator of the universe does. And this is where I, I, I begin to say, man, if you don't have the revelation of the love of God, because perfect love cast out all what? See, they didn't have faith in God's love at that time. If they knew that He loved Him, they knew they were going to go to the other side. And that's where we got to have faith in the love of God. The love of God will get us through any storm. And there's, this, I find myself saying this, Pastor, over and over and over. What time are we supposed to be done now? Amen. I like that. See, what I've been saying and what we can say when we're going through a hard time, He loves me. Everybody say, He loves me. Confess it out your mouth again. Say it again. He loves me. See, what should have happened at that time is, is, you know, by this time the water's hitting Jesus, and maybe he may have been like floating like a buoy. I don't know. The Word of God can't sink. Jesus walked on water. He was the Word walking on water. You know what that proof was? He can't sink. There ain't no way that joker was going to be sinking back there, sinking. No, he was going to float like a buoy. There's no way Jesus can sink. He's not a joker. Sorry about that, Jesus. There's no way the Word of God can sink. As long as Peter had his eyes on the Word, he didn't sink. But when he took his eyes off him and got his eyes on the storm, what happened? He began to sink. You get your eyes off the Word, you'll sink. You start thinking that God don't love you and God don't care for you, then that's an open door for Satan to attack you because you all of a sudden you don't even feel worthy enough to stand on God's promises. You don't feel worthy enough to, to, to even to speak the word of God with, with the voice of Jesus. You don't feel worthy enough. And all of a sudden, man, you don't even feel like you can succeed in anything you do in life because Satan gets you out of the love of God. And he can get you where you feel that God don't love you. And he'll get you in fear and you'll just quit. Quit on God. Quit the ministry. You know how many times I feel worthy enough to do what I do? Never. Never. I never feel like I'm somebody up here and I, I, I'm, no man, if you knew the real Kevin Wright, I, that I battle with insecurity quite a bit. I don't have all the right, you know, uh, vocabulary. I'm disqualified in the natural to do everything I do. I just don't spend time looking at me outside of Jesus. I spend my time looking at who I am in Jesus so I can keep doing what Jesus wants me to do. And as long as I keep my eyes on Him, I can preach. 
As long as I keep my eyes on him, I can lay hands on the sick and they can recover. As long as I keep my eyes on him, I can make it through any storm. Amen? As long as I stay right there, he and me, me and him, I can bear forth fruit. I can do all things through Christ. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Amen. Is this good? Say, mmm, this is good. All right, eat it up, eat it up. Eat that word. Now, you and I have experienced situations like this, not necessarily out of the sea, but that's the way it seems when Satan attacks your finances, your family, your business, your church. Sometimes attacks come in hurricane proportions, and you're thinking, dear God, what did I do? What brought this on? Hurricane proportions. Quit. Give up. God doesn't ever intend on us giving up. You know, quitting is not an option. Amen? Everybody say that out your mouth. Quitting is not an option. Never give up. But God came through. Listen, let's keep reading. This is going to be, look, I'm, are you with me? If you don't listen to what I'm going to say these next few moments, this whole, I can't even wrap it up. Mark ver, verse 38. And he was in the rear of the ship asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, care not that we perish. He expected his disciples. This is, the, this is it. This is the revelation. Jesus expected his disciples to use what they'd been taught. That's why he was asleep. He expected them to do what he was about to do because here's the thing. God, we have the same authority Jesus had. He gave it to us. He gave it to his disciples. Right? He expected them to deal with that storm, and they didn't. They disobeyed. And the storm was going to kill them. But, they, but Jesus had grace on them. Amen? Now, verse 39. And he what? Verse 39. What does arose mean in the Greek? Come on, say it again. What does arose mean? Now, storm arose when? Unexpectedly. But right here we see in the Greek that Jesus arose when? Satan never thinks that we're going to stand up that little low level devil when he sends his storms, when he sends his stuff and expects us to quit, expects us to blame God, expects, expects us to blame everybody else for what's going on in our lives. What happens? And Jesus arose unexpectedly. Come on, y'all ain't with me yet, are you? See, he devil never expects you to rise up unexpectedly with the Word of God in your mouth and the sword of the Spirit swinging wildly. Amen? Now, let's keep reading. And he rebuked it. He spoke to it. He used his authority. And he said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a what calm? Uh, what does great mean? A mega storm, he rose unexpectedly, and when he spoke to a mega storm, what happened to the mega storm? It was a mega calm. Come on, somebody. Come on. A mega storm just means that you're about to have a mega calm. It just means that God's about to turn this thing around and you're about to experience the peace that you've been longing for. But until you stand up and do what Jesus did, until you take the Word of God and use the Word of God the way it's designed to be used, you'll never experience the mega calm. As Jesus set the example for His disciples, He said, He rebuked it. He said, peace be still. He looked at His disciples. He said, why did you be afraid? Why did you fear? I love you. I care for you. You can have faith in my word. You can have faith in me. You can use my word. What you should have done was said, we're going to the other side. Look at the person next to you and say, we're going to the other side. We're on this ship together. We're going to the other side. Come on, say it. We're going to the other side. Satan don't want you having victory in anything in your life. The other side means breakthrough. 
The other side means you get what you pray for. The other side means healing. The other side means your family restored. The other side means whatever you've been believing God for. And what stands in between your amen to there it is, it's the devil trying to make you afraid. It's time we get from amen to there it is. To the other side. But here's the thing. Jesus put that word in your hands, in your mouth, and we've got to stand up in that same authority. Because here's the problem, church. And this is where some people may fall out. God put that revelation in us, but we've got to get up and say something to the storm. Because the moment you get into fear, you start believing the enemy's lies. Fear opens the door for Satan to come in and still kill and destroy. I'm telling you right now, that's... I, I went to the doctor recently, and they said, you have this disease. Pastor Kevin, I'm preaching the gospel. I'm preaching healings. Preaching about healing, I'm laying hands on the sick, and they're recovering. And then I go to the doctor, they said, you got this disease. I said, whoa. Man. The Lord said, what are you going to do about this? I'm asking him, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> you know, y'all ever been there? He's like, what you? I said, I'm going to use your word. I'm going to use your word. And I'm going to practice saying the thing Jesus said about me. Everybody say, same thing. Same thing means that's a profession of faith. A profession is saying the same thing Jesus said about you. All right, I got a report. I'm saying the same thing Jesus said, not the same thing the doctor said. All right, now I'm having to do everything I preached. <laughs> it's easy preaching you all up there and, you, and you, know, you ain't got no pain. You're not hurting. That's easy. But all of a sudden... You, you've been telling, I've been telling people, you know, God heals and this and that. And all of a sudden, I experience a storm. So guess what? I'm going to keep preaching the same thing I've been preaching all these years since I was 19 years old. I know it's, it was true then. It's true now. Jesus is the same today, tomorrow, and forever. All right. Everybody say, my mega storm is about to be a mega calm. God's going to calm some things down. He's the captain of your salvation. I'm expecting God to move on my behalf. Expect mega miracles in your life. Don't just stand there, say something. Don't just stand, don't just get on your boat, man, and and the storm's all around you, and you do nothing. The enemy will destroy you when you do nothing. It's just, look, man, the disciples would have died that day. They would have died that day. When, when we know what we're responsible for, we, carry, we have the opportunity to carry the word of life in us. God wants us to use the word of life. Amen. He wants us to use the word. You're sitting here and, man, uh, I don't know what your storm is. I don't know what you're going through, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm no better than you, you're no better than me. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's level. And, but I'm going to say this, I believe God put this word on my heart today. Somebody walked in here today and you said, man, I'm going through a mega storm. It don't look like I'm going to come out of it. it. looks like I'm going to die in this storm. It looks like, man, that God, God's not, He don't care for me. He don't love me. But there's a reason why God sent me to Grace City today to, to speak a word in season for somebody. If you're going through something, you're hurting. It's the toughest time of your life. You lost your job. You're struggling financially. You're struggling in your marriage. And you're struggling with life. Maybe you don't even feel like living. Maybe you feel like, man, it'd be easier just to die. That's a lie of Satan. You've got to be able to see beyond what... You've got to see with your third eye, man, the eye of faith. Because what you see in the natural is subject to change. Come on. Just because the doctor said I had something, 
I know you're sitting there wondering what it was. He said, I had irritable bowel syndrome, all right? <laughs> and I, 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 I battled it for years without even praying over it. Well, guess what? I don't have irritable bowel syndrome. I'm not on any medication for it. I'm on more fiber than I've ever been. I can tell you that. Come on, you get a little older, man. I mean, everybody, it seemed like everybody's got irritable bowel syndrome the way it was seeming at the time, man. You got to eat right. Come on. I'm constipated. Well, why? Well, you came to Grace City and that pastor talked about poop today. <laughs> Anybody watch Dr. Oz recently where he talked about what's in the poop? Come on, wave at me if you did. Wasn't that interesting? <laughs> I mean, you get done, you're like, hey, what's going on up in there? I see some people say, I'm talking to anybody over 40 now. If you're, over, if you're under 40, you don't look. But if you're over 40, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all be looking. Don't be lying. You be looking. Come on, don't lie. Wave at me. You don't lie. Come on. Some of y'all, stop lying up in church. I'm going to get you to confession right now. Now I'll be praying for every, every time I pray. You know, and now... My wife said, stop giving attention to that. I said, okay, Lord. The name of Jesus is more powerful than irritable bowel syndrome. And then irritable bowel syndrome, there's two. There's the kind that you, use, you, you, you eat and go straight to the bathroom. Then there's the constipation side where you eat and you can't use the bathroom. And that's what the doctor said I had. Now, that, that's no fun. I promise you. But guess what? I'm healed of that. I am set free from that. I, I don't receive that one bit. I'm healed in the name of Jesus. And I'm not going to lay down for the devil. I'm not going to let the devil do anything to my body. My body belongs to the Lord. I've got to preach this gospel till I'm 100 years old. That means every organ in my body has to live a long time. I've been speaking to my intestines. Long life over you intestines. Over my gallbladder. Long life over you gallbladder. Over my stomach. Long life over you. The Bible says long life belongs to me, so all my organs have to be ready for long life. Don't mean I'm going to go eat McDonald's today. Come on. I'm going to use wisdom. Come on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use wisdom. Y'all go ahead and stand with me. I'm done. Just about. Thank you, Lord. Look at me for a moment. Please, nobody leaving. Just uh, honor this time. Unless you have to go and you have commitments. I understand. I just want to pray for you. Um, if you're going through something this morning... And you just need some prayer. Man, just somebody to stand with you. I mean, life is tough. It's hard. And, you know, it just seems like, man, you just feel like giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel. And you just feel like God doesn't care. Maybe you feel like God's forgot about me. Way out, I'm way out here in the middle of the ocean. And where is God? God, I'm right here, God. Where are you at? I prayed. I believed. I've given, God, but where are you, God? I'm here to tell you right now. I'm here to tell you right now, God knows where you're at. He is not surprised about where you are. And God wants you to know how much He loves you today. How much He, how much he wants you to get to that other side.